Well, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn with me to the Gospel of John. We're in the Gospel of John this morning, chapter 1. We're going to be looking specifically at verses 40 through 42. So John chapter 1, verses 40 through 42. Well, I know it's not quite yet Christmas time, but uh, this morning he's kind of cool and we're kind of getting the crisp of the air, but... You know, one of the most well-known Christmas movies is that of It's a Wonderful Life. It's kind of a, a tradition for many of us to, to watch this movie. If you flip on, on to uh, any of the TV channels during the Christmas season, you're likely to see it maybe not just once, but, but many times and because it is just a staple in our, our American culture. So this morning, I, I do I want us to watch a, a quick clip of this from It's a Wonderful Life. Buffalo gals, can't you come out tonight? tonight can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Buffalo gals, can't you come out tonight? Dance by the light of the moon. What'd you wish when you threw that rock? Oh, no. Come on, no. tell me. If I told you, it might not come true. What is it you want, Barry? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Hey, that's a pretty good idea. I'll give you the moon, Mary. I'll take it. Then what? Well, then you could swallow it, and it all dissolve, see? And the moonbeams would shoot out of your fingers and your toes and the ends of your hair. Am I talking too much? Yes! Why don't you kiss her instead of talking her to death? How is that? Why don't you kiss her instead of talking her to death? Want me to kiss her, huh? Oh, use is wasted on the wrong people. <laughs> it's a wonderful life. What comes to your mind when you think of having a, a wonderful life? Is it to having the, the moon, as Jimmy Eustace said here in this movie? Or is it maybe having the point where you have enough money to where you're financially secure. You don't have to, to worry about not having enough money in the bank to pay all of the bills or to, to go on that vacation that you desire to go on. Maybe having the, a wonderful life is, is the birth of a, a new child and being able to raise up a, a great family. Or maybe it's to, to finally get to where you want to be in your career. Maybe it's having nice possessions, getting that sports car that you've eyed since you were a, a teenager. What is it that would give you a wonderful life? What about, though, in, in the kingdom of God? What is it that makes a wonderful life in the kingdom of, of God? That's what I want us to, to focus on this morning, is what is it that makes a wonderful life in the kingdom of God? As we are closing out our series this morning and who's your one we've spent many of the last several weeks looking at the aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how that should not only be our greatest desire but that should also be our greatest desire for others as well so we're going to see this morning in our passage what God sees as a wonderful Life. So if you would, turn uh, to uh, John chapter 1, verses 40 through 42. We read these words. One of the two who had heard John speak and follow Jesus was, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Now Peter's brother, Andrew, may be one of the least known uh, disciples in, in Jesus' inner circle. We know quite a bit about James and John, right? They are the sons of thunder, Right? They both wrote books in the, God, in the Bible, but we don't see anything about a letter of, from Andrew or a gospel of, 
of Andrew because he's just normally left out. And he, he kind of sticks to, to the background. He's not one that's out in the, in the front. And, and we're going to learn, too, this morning that, though, that he was used by our Lord to touch thousands of people. But he did so not by preaching great sermons. In fact, we don't hear of any sermons that Andrew ever gave in the Bible. But it was through Andrew's focus of just one. Uh, uh, Homer Lindsay is a pastor who used to pastor down in, in Florida. He's now deceased. But he would often refer to Andrew as, as the inviter. But now, I, while he is the inviter, I can also kind of see Andrew as, as the bringer or as the introducer. Right? He, he, he brought people to, to Jesus or he introduced them to Jesus as we, we see here with uh, his brother, Simon Peter. But you know, had Andrew had never been born, the New Testament could likely have been changed significantly. Right? Peter may have never been saved. Right? Someone else would have preached the famous sermon at, at Pentecost. Peter, first and second Peter would have to be eliminated from the Bible. Right? And only heaven knows what else would have been left out of the Bible and of church history had Andrew never been born. See, Andrew was the first of all of the disciples to be, to be called out. And it was in his eagerness to follow Christ, combined with his zeal for introducing other people to Christ, it fairly typifies Andrew's character. I mean, think Peter, James, John, and, and Andrew. Right? These are the, the inner circle of, of Jesus' disciples, right? And certainly Andrew was the, the least conspicuous. Scripture doesn't tell us a lot about him. In fact, in the New Testament, he only appears nine times in the, these pages. And most of the references to Andrew were only in, in passing. I mean, he lived his life in the shadows of his better known brother, Peter. I, didn't, I mean, in fact, he's even mentioned in the text, not as Andrew, but as Simon Peter's brother. Now, however, though, Lest, lest we forget here that Andrew is the one who introduced Peter to Jesus. And it is Andrew that shows that he had the right heart for effective ministry, not in the forefront, not to where he could get all the praise and acclamation from people, but from the background. Andrew's name means manly. Andrew was, was a fisherman by trade. He wasn't just an ordinary fisherman. He was a strong fisherman. And his life proved him. He was a bold and decisive and he was deliberate in his actions. He was driven by this hearty passion for, for the truth. And, and he was willing to subject himself to the most extreme kinds of hardship. Now Andrew's personal encounter with, with Jesus, it, it took place just a few months after Jesus' baptism. You remember Jesus was baptized in, in the Jordan River and it was Andrew and, and John. They were standing next to John the Baptist. Andrew was a follower of John the Baptist. He was one of his disciples and they were standing next to him when Jesus walked by and, and John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God. So Andrew and John became Jesus' first disciples. But the news that Andrew heard was, oh, it was too good for him to keep to himself. So what did he do? He went out and he told somebody about Jesus. Not just anybody, but he found the one person in the world that he loved the most. Whom he most wanted to know, Jesus. And he led that person to Christ. Oftentimes in, in, in our, our, our world today, we, we see success with, with, with large things. Right? If you're a successful person, you have a, what, a large house. Right? Or maybe you have a large bank account. Right? Or 
If you win the basketball game or the football game, you have the most points. Right? We see that success is by being greater, not by, by being lesser. But this morning, I want us, as we look at the disciple Andrew, I want us to see what he valued. And we're going to get three specific things that Andrew valued. And first of which is, is that he saw the value of individual people. Right? Andrew saw the value of individual people. So Andrew, he appreciated the value of just one single soul. He was known not for his great oratory and preaching to the multitudes, but he was known for bringing individuals to Jesus. I mean, almost every time in these nine accounts in the Bible that we see of Andrew, and he is bringing someone to Christ. He brought Peter to Jesus. Right? Just one he also brought the boy with his lunch. You remember Jesus feeding the 5,000, right? Jesus is, is teaching this, the crowd of 5,000 men more with, by the time you count in the women and, and children. And they began to get hungry, right? And, and Jesus says, well, let's go and find them something to eat. And what did they do? The disciples were like, well, where are we going to feed them? I mean, there's, there's no Chick-fil-A down the road, right? How are they going to eat? And they're like, let's just send them back home. Let them go get a good meal. And then they can come back and then they'll be ready to, to learn. Jesus says, no, no, I don't, that's, that's not how we're going to do this. So it was Andrew who went and found this little boy. And he, through that, they were able to do the miracle of feeding the 5,000. Now, Andrew is re- referred to as, as the first home missionary because of, of the Jewish people that, that he brought to, to Jesus. And he's also, though, referred maybe as even the first foreign missionary because of the Greeks that he brought to Jesus in John chapter 12. See, most people, most people do not come to Christ as an immediate response to a sermon that is preached in a, in a, in a crowd type of setting. No, they come to Christ because of the influence of an individual. Andrew brought one, his brother Peter. And then what did Peter do? He brought thousands. Right? All of the fruit of Peter's ministry is ultimately also the fruit of Andrew's faithful individual witness. This past week I was uh, chatting with my my dad, and uh, who is pastors at church down in Tennessee, I'd be in, uh, actually be in prayer for my father. Come to find out this uh, Friday afternoon, he, he had a heart attack, and uh, but he, everything's okay now. He ended up, uh, uh, this, earlier in the week I talked to him, and he said he's been working out at the gym, and he says, you know, I think I worked out a little too hard. I'm getting kind of older. I need to cut it back a little bit. He's like, I just don't feel right. And then uh, come to find out it was because his heart was not working properly. And, uh, but every, they, they put in a couple of stints and uh, uh, he's going to have to uh, take some medicine and change his diet a little bit. But, uh, but we, were, we were talking and chatting and he was telling me about a young man that, that he had been uh, working on. My dad uh, is kind of a night owl and so he, would, he often goes to the grocery store at, at night. 9 or 10 o'clock, which is pretty smart because, uh, you know, last week we, we, we talked about out hell. And, um, you know, when I go to the grocery store at, you know, 5 or 6 o'clock, I, I can hear the gnashing of teeth there. You know, it is just a miserable experience. But he likes to go at 9 or 10 because usually there's nobody, nobody there. And so uh, he, he said that uh, this, this past week, the week, week past, he said, I went to the, the grocery store. It was Friday night after the football game. He went to the high school football game down there. And he said, there's this young man that, that kind of bags the groceries. And he said, I've been seeing him for about a year. It's a young Iranian uh, man, college student. He moved from Iran to, uh, to go to, to college there in, in the town. And, and he said, every, every time I was there, I was always very nice to him and, and, uh, and, and talked to him just to, to hear about him, to get him to, to tell me a little bit about himself. But he said, you know, I found that, that for several months, like seven or eight months, I never saw the guy. I didn't know what happened. In fact, I asked one of the, 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 the people there, the, 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 one of the managers, and said, what happened to, to so-and-so? And he said, well, he, he got a promotion, and now he's back in running the, the stock room in the back. So he's not out, you know, out in front as much. And he's like, oh, okay. When, just kind of let it, let it go. But then this past 
Friday night, he saw this, uh, this young gentleman there bagging the groceries. And he said, hey, I've, I missed you. And the guy asked, he said, well, I haven't seen you around. He's like, well, I've been here. And he said, well, I've been in the, in the back. And, and he's like, oh, okay, okay. And he, they, they, they threw, threw some small talk. He uh, said, what, are you, you know, what have you been doing? He's like, well, and dad said, well, I just got back from our high school football game. He's like, football, like, like soccer? And he's like, no, 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 it's American football. And he said, oh, so you were, were you out there playing? He's like, I'm 61 years old. No, I was not out there, out there playing. But he said, no, I, in my, my, my church that I, I passed, we have a lot of our, our students are, play on the football team. So I went out there to, to support them in, in, their, in their playing. And he said, so just coming to get a, get a few things after that. And he said, oh, so you're a pastor. And he, he didn't know what, what that was. And so dad explained to him uh, that. And, and, and so dad then invited him to come to church with him. And uh, the young boy said, well, I, I work every Sunday. I'm not going to be able to, you know, can't really take off work to be able to come to church. That's well, that's, right, did you know, we, we meet on Wednesday night as, as well. He's like, you know what, I'm, I'm off this Wednesday. He said, you know what, I think, I'll, I think I'll come to your church. Now, I don't know if you've ever been, I've been in this position when you're talking to people and they're like, yeah, yeah, I'll come. And to be honest, you, you really never expect them to come. They just kind of say that to be, be nice to you. But that began to, pray for this young Iranian man uh, that he would come and so on Wednesday night during the prayer meeting time he, he actually asked the church to pray for this young man and but it didn't look like he was going to come because the church had already started didn't see him but then they saw the back doors open and this young man walked down this happened just this past Wednesday and he didn't really know what was going on it's probably likely his very first time ever in a in a church and as he's coming in, but everybody in that church that had been praying, they knew what had happened. And it all came through just one, one invitation. Now, yes, the seed had been planted for many, many months, but, but this young man didn't know my dad was a, a preacher, and it didn't come through him making an effort to go to, you know, to knock on his door to, to share the gospel with him or hand him a gospel track. No, it came because my dad was hungry after the football game and went to go get some get some groceries and he just began to talk and dad looked for that opportunity to, to just take an ordinary conversation just telling him what he did to become an inviter and see all of us can can do that we can become inviters because it starts with just one and at this moment we don't know the young man probably is not a believer in christ but they are continuing to pray that, that God would save him from his sins. So we see that, that just as Andrew was the inviter, we too can be inviters as, as well. How many of you ever heard the name of Edward Kimball? Edward Kimball, likely most of us probably are not familiar with the name of Edward Kimball, but Edward Kimball was a, a Sunday school teacher. And in fact, he was the Sunday school teacher who led the great pastor D.L. Moody to, to Christ. See, Edward, went, he went to this Boston shoe store where an 18-year-old D.L. Moody was, was working that day. So <laughs> Kimball went in and he kind of cornered Moody there in, in, the, in, the, in the stock room and, and he introduced him to Christ. I think, wow, that's a pretty bold move by here, a, a well-to-do uh, Sunday school teacher to, to share the gospel with this young 18-year-old boy. But, but Kimball was not a bold person at all. He was anything from bold, in fact. He, he was a timid, very soft-spoken person. And he said that, that he went into that, that shoe store and he said he was frightened. <laughs> He was trembling and he was unaware whether or not he even had the courage to be able to, to confront this young man with the gospel. But Moody, on, on the other hand, he was kind of the opposite of, of, of Edward Kimball. He, he was, um, Moody was, uh, he was crude. He was, had a foul mouth. He was a rough young guy. Men that some of us may even just write off as saying, there's no hope for this young man. But Moody was also, he was not educated at all. He was illiterate. He couldn't read. So handing him a Bible probably wasn't going to do him much good. But Kimball said as, uh, in his account, he, tr he said he, as he was trembling in his boots. He, he recalled this incident. And he said that Moody had begun to attend his, his Sunday school class. 
He said that Moody was totally untaught and ignorant about the Bible. Didn't know anything about the Bible. And he said, I decided to speak to Moody about Christ and about his soul. So he said, I started downtown to the Holton's shoe store. He said, when I nearly was there, I began to wonder whether I ought to even go in during business hours. And I thought, maybe my mission, maybe going in there, it might embarrass him. And I might turn him off to Jesus and maybe kind of end the relationship. And, and he said, but then I went away. Then, then when I went away, the other clerks, me and might have asked who I was. And, and they might taunt Moody for me even talking to him and trying to make this bad young man into a, a good boy, right? And he said, while I was pondering over all of this, he said, I passed the store without noticing it. Then when I found I had gone by the door, I determined to make a dash for it and have it over at once. So Kimball, he went and he found Dwight Moody. He was back in the stock room. And he spoke with him, he said, with limping words. Later, Kimball said, I never could remember what I said. Something, you know, about Christ and his love. And he said, be honest, that was all. <laughs> he said, he admitted that this was a weak appeal he didn't go through all of the points of the gospel. He didn't, you know, go through the, the sinner's prayer and go through every. He, he said, but, but Moody, then and there, gave his heart to Christ, even with his inadequate gospel presentation. And we know that, that Dwight L. Moody became one of the great evangelists of our time. Pastor and founder of the, the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, Moody Bible Church, tens of of thousands of people have testified that they have come to faith in Jesus Christ under Moody's ministry. Why Moody led a man named C.T. Studd. He was the great pioneer missionary to Christ. The guy named William Chapman who himself became a well-known evangelist. Moody founded the institute, the Moody Bible Institute that has trained thousands of men to, for ministry. In fact, we can, we can trace the salvation of Billy Graham back to D.L. Moody. And it's because it all started, though, with, with one man, Edward Kimball, who in his inadequacy, in his timidness, walked into that shoe store and shared the gospel the, the best that he could to a young man who gave his life to Christ. Secondly, we see here that, that Andrew saw the value of insignificant gifts. He saw the value of insignificant gifts. You see, some people see the big picture more clearly because they appreciate the value of, of the small things. You've heard it said, right, the devil is in the details. Right? It's in the small things. You know, in the feeding of the 5,000 story, Philip's vision was overwhelmed by this size of the need. Look here at John chapter 8, verses, or 6, verses 8 and 9. It said, one of his disciples, Andrew, again, he's Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? See, I mean, we're not talking about Huge, you know, a bread truck of, of bread. All right, barley loaves, we're talking a little bit of bread. I mean, they, they brought just enough food to feed their family. In fact, in the Greek, the, the, uh, the, the, these fish, it's more of sardines. Right? I don't know anybody getting excited about eating, eating a few sardines, but, uh, but this is what had come. And, and so we see here that, though that there is no insignificant gift in the hands of Jesus, Jesus took these little barley loaves, five barley loaves, and two fish, and he was able to feed 5,000 plus people. And they didn't just have enough, right? They had leftovers. A small gift can be used amazingly in the hands of Jesus. Look here in, in Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. See, Jesus looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. Then he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. 
For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. You know, the Bible says we should be cheerful givers. Right? And, and yes, we are called to, to give, to support the ministry of the church, to give to missions, to help with social causes such as alleviating hunger. I think there's some people here that we, we're not giving because we might think, you know what, I don't have as much to give as maybe some of the other people. And to be honest, it's not even worth me, me giving what I got because my gift is, honestly, it's too sig- insignificant. It, it, it can't really make any type of, of difference. But we see that there is no insignificant, insignificant gift in the hands of of Jesus, look at this poor widow. Jesus says that her gift was greater than all of them because she gave out of her poverty and gave all that, that she had. See, God's ability to use a gift is no way hindered or enhanced by the size of the gift. God has called some people to give lots because they have lots. But God has called some to give little because maybe they have little. The effectiveness of the gift is not based on the giver, but it's based on the greatness of God. See, it's not the the greatness of the gift that counts, but it is of God, His greatness that it's given. The miracle of of this 5,000 feeding them illustrates it's the way that God works. See, He takes the sacrificial and often the insignificant gifts of people who give faithfully and and he multiplies those gifts to accomplish monumental things. Lastly, we see that Andrew saw the value of inconspicuous service. He saw the value of inconspicuous service. See, Andrew is the picture of those who, who labor quietly in humble places. He's the one that, you know what, he's rarely mentioned in Scripture. You know, there's no St. Peter's Chapel that's named after him. You can go to the Vatican, and you may find a little bit of, of Andrew there, but Jesus didn't say, Andrew, on you I'm building my church. We don't have any books in Scripture written by Andrew. But Andrew labored hard. But he labored quietly and humble places. He wasn't there to, to seek praise, to get uh, acclimates, to, to receive awards for his service to the Lord. No, he did it quietly. I know there's many of you here this morning that you too labor quietly in humble places for the Lord. We might think that, well, you know what, if I can't become a, a teacher, Sunday school teacher, or have an influence, be able to influence a lot of people, then really what's, what's worth my time? You know, is it worth my time to, to work with, you know, some preschoolers or children? You know what, I'm not even really gifted in, in doing that. And to be honest, you know, in the nursery, all I do is just change diapers and rock some, some baby. What, I mean, what good am I really, really doing? But we see the people of God is made up of many people who labor quietly in inconspicuous and humble places. The book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul writes, Don't work only while being watched as, as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ. Do God's will from your heart. We don't serve the Lord so that we might have a platform to be able to to make a great name for ourselves. We don't serve the Lord so that really we can, you know what, we can work our way up the, the, the success ladder in the church and become a, a leader in the church and be able to make decisions and, you know, and have people to tell us how great we are. No, we are to, to work as slaves of Christ, to do God's will, not from what we get right, but from, but from your heart. See, Andrew did not mind being hidden. 
as long as the work was being done. Right? There is work that must be done. And most of the work is is behind the scenes. Most of the work comes in the form of just going to the grocery store at 9, 10 o'clock at night and talking to the bag boy, seeing them as it's a real person, right? You know, they're, they're not just a, a blank face. Open in a conversation. Or it may be as your waitress or waiter at the restaurant as you leave here. So be, be good, good tippers. In fact, I, I saw a, a, another pastor on, uh, posted on a Twitter that he, he learned something from his mother. He said, I went to a restaurant and I had terrible service. And he said, I made sure to tip extra. This time. He said, yes, you know what? The food wasn't all that great. The service was horrible. But, you know, my mom always told me that you don't know what that that woman has gone through the day. She may be having the worst day of her life. You know what? And just think about how you are blessing her. Even though, you know what? You're not really getting what what you paid for. Isn't that a picture of the gospel? (laughs) Isn't that, you know, we... Receive the gift of salvation, not because we deserve it right, but because of God's love and His mercy on us. So Peter, this inconspicuous service, laboring quietly and behind the scenes in, in a humble attitude, that is what God has called us to. See, Andrew, he was a leader with the servant's heart. Andrew never preached to multitudes. He never founded any churches. But he was a great servant of the Lord. Tradition actually tells us that Andrew took the gospel north into the nation of now Russia and possibly even went all the way to, to, to Scotland. Andrew was ultimately came back and he was, was crucified the town of Achaia, which is in southern Greece, near down near Athens. One account says that, that Andrew had led the wife of a provincial Roman governor to Christ. And that infuriated this, this woman's husband. And the, the governor demanded that his wife recant her devotion to Jesus. But she stood up to her husband and said, No, I can't do that. Well, the governor was infuriated because really it's Andrew's the reason that that his wife would not recant Christ. And so he he had Andrew crucified. As we read in history, we find that Andrew was crucified a little differently than than how Jesus was. They didn't nail put nails in his hands and in his feet. You no, know, he was he was lashed to the cross in order to prolong his suffering. Tradition also tells us that the cross wasn't the the typical cross that we we, we see now. It was an an X-shaped cross. And most accounts tell us that that Andrew hung on the cross for two days. And as he was hanging on that cross, gasping for every breath in immense pain, he took those two days, he didn't waste any time, but he preached to everybody that walked by that cross so that they would turn their lives to Christ for their salvation. Apostle Paul tells us in the book of First Corinthians, sorry, it says here, it said, Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world To shame the strong. And God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world. What is viewed as nothing. To bring to nothing what is viewed as something. So that no one may boast in his his presence. So the question I want us to leave with is. What value do you place on individuals this morning? What value do you place on on your one? 
the one that you're praying for, to receive Christ? What value do you place on insignificant gifts? Do you feel like, you know, I just don't have much, so, you know what, I'm going to let those that have a lot do the work, and, you know what, I'm just going to kind of sit back and just, just take it easy. And then maybe when I get a lot, then I'll be able to, to use my gifts in service of the kingdom. Lastly, do you value inconspicuous service? Why do you serve the Lord? Is it to, to make you feel good, to give you a warm, fuzzy feeling inside of you? Is it so that you might gain respect of other people or even find yourself getting a, a plaque somewhere in prominence? Are you serving the Lord because of your humility and, and in the background? Because of who Christ is and what he has done for us. Would you pray with me, please, this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, we, we come here this morning in awe of who you are, God, in, in awe of, of what you have done. God, we thank you for Jesus. For those of us who are saved, we have received a gift that we could never get on our own, no matter how many millions of dollars are in our bank accounts. No matter what influence we have on other people, what kind of fame we have. But God, in your love for us, in your mercy for us, you sent your son Jesus Christ to come and to die on the cross so that we might be saved. To die the death that we deserved. So that we might have eternal life. God, we're thankful that you chose your son, to humble himself so that we may receive riches, untold riches. God, I pray for those here this morning that may not yet know Jesus. I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. God, I pray that they would, would turn from their sin and realize and cry out to Jesus that, Jesus, I need you. I need you to save me from my sin. God, I pray that they would turn from that sin and that they would put their faith and trust in Jesus this morning. God, I pray for all of us that, God, that we would see the value of of small numbers, of the value of the individual, the value of insignificant gifts and inconspicuous service. God, I pray that each and every one of us would ask ourselves this question and God that you would answer it for us how can I serve you in what ways do you want me to serve you Lord how am I to to give back to you through through money through our finances God how am I to to give to you in through the time that I have and the the gifts that you have blessed me with God, I pray that we, would, that we would see the importance of just one person. For we have no idea what impact the gospel might have in that one person that we've been praying for to receive Jesus. Who knows that that one person may be like D.L. Moody. Who can have an impact for generations to come. God, I pray that you would use whatever we have for your glory. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.